So we're lucky today to be joined by Dave Zirin, the nation's sports editor and author of 11 books now, I believe, uh, on the politics of sports. And he is joining us today from Barcelona. What's up, Dave? Hey, it's great to be here. It is 1.05 a.m. in Barcelona, and I could not be happier to be spending this time with everybody here. Seriously, Barcelona's got nothing on this Zoom call, I swear. <laughs> you out there running with the bulls? Uh, no, because um, I, I, that would be specious. I'm just uh, more uh, chilling with some paella and some sangria and uh, doing my thing. That's no, fun. but in all seriousness, you know, in, um, in Barcelona, the 92 Olympics were held and it's often held up as a model of how the Olympics should be run. And there's a lot of ugly underbelly to that 92 Olympics Barcelona story. So I'm actually doing some investigation. Yes, there is sangria involved, but I'm doing more investigation into the 92 Olympics. They have a museum here, an archive here, and, you know, that's my focus. Right on. Right. Thank you for making the time, for real. Uh, appreciate that. You know, I love the new book you just dropped, The Kaepernick Effect. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, and I'm excited to dig into the book. But, you know, in the beginning of the book, you write that after interviewing many of the uh, people in the book, many of them young people, uh, you said that you understood the Kaepernick Effect was not the result of someone else's protest, but a cause, a catalyst for something far greater. You you rethought what the whole concept of the Kaepernick effect really was. So can you tell us what is the Kaepernick effect? Wow. I mean, the best way to tell you and the best way to make it clear would be to start by saying I was having a conversation with John Carlos. And he was, of course, one of the 1968 Olympians who raised his fist on the medal stand. Um, I wrote John's memoir with him. And he's just not, not only a dear, dear friend, but a total hero <laughs> to me and an inspiration. Um, and John Carlos said to me in a very offhanded way, like, you know, there were a lot of people who raised their fists in 1968 after we did at athletic events. That happened a lot. And it really made me think for a second, like, my goodness, I don't know any of those stories. That's been completely thrown into the memory hole. We're not taught that. And we don't know it. And one reason is that nobody really recorded it and took the time to do what I call the, you know, the studs turkle work of actually going to the folks and, and actually doing those kinds of interviews and getting the, and, and really learning about how, you know, the real motor of history, the real hand on the lever of history involves, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people whose names we'll, we'll never know. But I think our, one of our jobs as educators or as writers is to get as many people as possible to know these names, partly because it takes away from kind of the passivity with how we study history sometimes. Like history is made by other people, great people, usually great men, and the rest of us are just sort of spectators to the story of history, the greatest story ever told. And that's not really how history changes, though. Uh, history changes through the actions of of masses and masses of people. And sure, great individuals arise from those masses, but the work of the masses needs to be uh, recognized and told so we can learn the lessons. Uh, and one of the great lessons is that history is not just about one human being, it's about what we all do collectively. And so I started thinking a lot about all the young people who took a knee uh, after Colin Kaepernick did. And all these one-off stories, a lot of which I wrote for the nation about this particular high school in Detroit where kids got beer thrown on their heads and cups thrown at them and bottles that. thrown at them. Yeah, out in Detroit. Or uh, thinking about other stories in small towns like Beaumont, Texas, just all these stories, these amazing stories. And I was like, we need to have a book that brings all of these stories together. So that was the first motivation for the book. But then that changed as I was working on it after the police murder of George Floyd. Uh, Cause I went back and I called all the people I'd interviewed um, and to see how they were doing and how they were feeling. And they were all either at demonstrations or organizing people for demonstrations. And 
That made me realize that while many roads may have led to the summer of 2020 and the largest protests in the history of the United States, one of those roads runs straight through the athletic fields of the United States. And that to me was a story that needed to be told. Yeah, no doubt. I'm so glad you told it. And I'm hoping you can share some of those stories with us. What are some of your favorite stories? And, you know, I love how you you organize the book in terms of the first third is high school students and then college students and then pro athletes. But I'm thinking, especially for this group, if we can focus on the high school students in the book, whose courage to kneel during the anthem really was catalytic for this national movement. And I'm especially interested in the role of black girls and young women athletes who are, whose leadership played, I think really a decisive role in propelling this movement forward. Yeah, a couple of things I wanna share is first is that um, I interviewed these dozens and dozens of people. Most of the people I talked to for the book actually are high school students. And that was very much on purpose. Um, I could have done a whole book about pro athletes who took a knee during the anthem to protest uh, racial inequity and police violence. Um, I could have done a whole book about college students, but I wanted the book to be proportional relative to my research. And in my research, what did we see? You know, we see tons of young people, tons of people who aren't old enough to vote are the ones propelling this movement. Uh, you see, an incredible, incredible interaction with the young person in their community after they take that knee in terms of the conversation it starts or the backlash it provokes. Also, when I was looking at the movement nationally, it was, it was really inspiring, like how many young women were part of the struggle. And that needed to be represented in the book. And then it was frankly a little bit surprising, I'm just gonna be very honest, how many cheerleaders were part of the struggle. So I knew the cheerleaders needed to be represented uh, in the book as well. See, that's so important is that the, for the book to have proportionality, because I really, I wanted it to represent what I think was in a lot of respects, a subconscious mass movement in this country of people in big states and little states, uh, blue states, red states, small towns, big cities, um, taking a knee and facing very, very similar uh, repercussions for it, very similar backlashes for it. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I do want to say stories from the book, but I got to say, when I started writing the book, I felt pretty pessimistic about the state of the world. I mean, the pandemic was just starting and wasn't feeling great about uh, some of the choices headed up for the election. But after talking to these young people, I really did go from being pessimistic to optimistic uh, because the, the young people, the young people listening to this right now, I mean, they were so tough in the face of so much uh, crap that was thrown at them. Yeah. And they were so strong um, in the face of so many people who told them not to do anything. And they, they were so... There's no other word for it. They're old souls, you know? It's like, I was talking to young people, the name, when I asked them like, well, who is your biggest inspiration for taking that knee during the anthem and for risking everything that you risked? You know, and when I talk about risk, I mean, we're talking about like, not just getting in trouble with your coach or the school administrator, we're talking about uh, violent threats against right. them, against their family, against the school. Stakes are really high. Uh, when they're doing this and uh, and their courage in the face of that was so intense. And so as I was saying, when I asked, what was your reason for doing this? Who inspired you? I thought the name I would hear most of all was Colin Kaepernick, but that's not the case at all. The name I heard more than any other was Trayvon Martin. And in speaking to them, it, it really clicked with me like, wow, you know, here I am talking to these folks in 2019, 2020, and Trayvon Martin was murdered by George Zimmerman at age 14 in 2012. So that's eight years earlier. So if I'm talking to a 17 year old and they're saying that their inspiration was Trayvon Martin, that means they were nine. And that means it marked them in a very sincere way. And it reminded me so much of stories that I'd heard about 
the, that first generation of civil rights activists in the 50s um, speaking about Emmett Till. Yeah. And um, Emmett Till, who was also 14 years old. Um, that's one similarity. Emmett Till, yeah. who was also violently killed um, uh, because of the color of his skin. That's, of course, another similarity. But the biggest and similarity. Rosa Parks uh, famously, you know, credited him with yeah. her decision not to move, right? Yeah. Oh, Muhammad Ali said that uh, that was the start of his radicalization, was being a child and seeing uh, his face in Emmett Till's face when, when he would look at him. Um, and and the, the biggest similarity, though, is that there was no justice. So it's like, okay, you can brazenly kill us and we cannot uh, receive justice from this society. That's what they were saying to me. And that's what made it for them like this thing where they had to do something. And they, they were just so brave in the face of what they were dealing with. Someone joked with me that the book should be called What to Expect When You're Protesting, like what to expect when you're expecting, because it's got all of these scenarios about what do you do if your coach supports you? What do you do if your coach stabs you in the back? What do you do if your friends don't talk to you anymore? What do you do if, if your, your family gets a death threat? And these people, they, they talk, they talk me and they talk the reader through all of these remarkable scenarios that they're forced to deal with and, you know, that they dealt with with a lot of courage. And that's why if, if people have read my other books, I don't know if you have or not, but like my voice tends to be in there pretty centrally. With this book, I took a massive, massive step backwards um, and really looked more, had folks, you know, just listen to them. And so it's their words on Front Street, their experiences on Front Street. And um, and then the last thing I'll say is that that's also why I am uh, donating proceeds of the book to the organization Serve Your City, which is a, an amazing mutual aid group in DC run by uh, my dear friend, Maurice Cook. And because the, the idea for me is that the courage of these young folks needs to be paid forward. And people my age can't just sort of cross our arms and say, yay, young people, save us. I'm going to have a drink. Right. No, but we need to figure out ways to center them, center their voices, center their struggles, but also figure out how we can support them educationally, uh, materially, organizationally, whatever skills people like you and I have, have developed along the way yeah. over the years. It's like we need to bring them to bear for them and for their work. Right on, right on. Well, you said that you, you started the project off uh, pessimistic about society and you ended very optimistically after talking to these young people. So I, following up on that, I just hope you could just say a little bit more about what you learned about the consciousness and the political beliefs of young people by doing these interviews and then how the 2020 uprising impacted that consciousness? Yeah, a great question. I mean, this generation is less tolerant of intolerance than any generation in the history of the United States. And that makes them both uh, very precious and it also makes them very tough because, you know, we, we live in a society that, that mocks people for giving a damn, that mocks people. You know, they, they call us the woke mob, you know, they they use the word woke as a racial slur even when it started in the black community. It's, uh, it's that's what it's become in, in, in their hands. And to have young people care in the face of that and to have them act in the face of that. You know, the, the story I always go back to is when um, my, my daughter was in uh, eighth grade, there was a call for a school walkout at her public school and they were in junior high. And so the principal of the school said, okay, you can have the walkout because there were too many students who were ready to do it, but we're gonna walk out to the football field and hear talks. So they weren't really walking off of school grounds, they were walking to another safe space. And um, what that led was to a protest inside the school of the principal from having them go, <laughs> for not letting them walk off of school grounds. So it's just, you know, this idea that they're, they're playing chess, you know, and they're, 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 they're what, I, what I learned, you asked the question is so good. It's like, what did I learn speaking to them? 
um, is, you know, I, I learned that they're going to fight for a better world in a different world. And I think that they're going to be unapologetic about doing so. And I also think that they were the we the political weather vane for those 2020 protests, which, you know, the size of those protests, the biggest protests in U.S. history took a lot of people by surprise. A lot of people, you know, that there were protests in all 50 states took a lot of people by surprise. If we had been paying attention to what these young folks were doing throughout 17, 18, 19, and the way they were really, you know, spreading the word, That's you right. know, spreading the word of you can take a knee during the anthem and really hold up a mirror to this country. You know, you can have a conversation about the gap between what this country says it represents and the lived experiences for black and brown people in one of the most unequal societies the earth has ever produced. Like if we, if you can do that and spread that word town by town by town, and if we were, if, the, if our media in this country was an actual media and was tracking how that was going, then 2020 would not have surprised anybody. Right. We would have right. said the groundwork was being laid. And similarly, this generation, if we had paid attention to what they'd been doing in 17, 18, 19, um, and we had followed the backlash that they would have to receive and how not just uncomfortable, but it made, but violent, it made certain sectors of their communities uh, when they were dared challenge on like, why is this country so racist? And, you know, what are you doing about it to make it different? You know, it's like, if we had seen how the, those people in these small towns did not say, well, let's agree to disagree or, well, let's get together and have a conversation about it, but instead responded with that level of vitriol and, you know, the, the, the looming threat of violence. If we had paid attention to that, then these 2021 so-called CRT debates, like that wouldn't have caught people as much off guard either. Uh, because that that was there in all of these small towns. It wasn't just it, people, I think, got it twisted and thought that stuff was concentrated at Trump rallies when it was concentrated everywhere. Mm. And, you know, whether red state, blue state, you know this better than anybody, Jesse. Like, like you can be Seattle or you can be Beaumont, Texas. Yeah. And there are going to be people there who uh, feel like white supremacy should be the order of the day. And any challenge to that is inherently deeply, deeply offensive. Right. And they feel that offense in the marrow of their bones. And you're seeing that level of twisted, distorted passion at these school board meetings. But these young people saw them for years in the lead up to what we're dealing with today. Yeah. Yeah, they did. And I think you're totally right about uh, the resolve of young people today and it's just amazing to see how they use their platform as being student athletes and you know you know my favorite part of the book is talking about the students from my class at Garfield High School it was incredible to see their stories just come to life in the pages of your book and and get to uh, see the smiles on their face when when uh, you know that that section of the book got on into Sports Illustrated and they were they were celebrated for their resistance after all they'd been through, after the death threats that came streaming into Garfield High School for Jelani and Janelle taking knees at their football and softball teams it was just a really important vindication of their work. And so I just thank you very much for helping to lift those young people up, you know, my own students, but also all of them across the country who uh, deserve that recognition for their bravery. And yeah, thank, thank you so much uh, for saying that. And that, that's wonderful to hear. And certainly one of the most rewarding things about the process has been hearing from students, the people I profiled, you know, saying to me, okay, you got, you got the story, you got it right. Nice. Thank you for, thank you for putting it together. Um, I, I would also just add though, Jesse, that you are one of the sort of very low key heroes of the book, because one of the common threads in the book is that the actions of teachers are really important in this process. Uh, and so many of the people I interviewed, oftentimes the coach 
distance themselves from the athlete. Sometimes teammates distance themselves. Always the administration would distance themselves. But oftentimes it was the teacher giving them a pat on the back. You know, the no, teacher, I, my yeah. favorite story was, was the teacher, who, the student felt so alone and so isolated. And, uh, and she did it with a friend of hers and she walked into her high school classroom and the teacher yells, hey, it's Tommy Smith and John Carlos, everybody. Woo! <laughs> and and that, of course, developed a thirst in her to read about Tommy Smith and John Carlos. And that was another common thread I saw, Jesse, is that for a lot of these folks, Kaepernick was really their only example of athlete activism. So Kaepernick's great gift to them was this language of protest that they could do as athletes. Uh, their inspiration might have been Trayvon Martin, but the person who gave them, who bequeathed to them this language of protest as an athlete was Colin Kaepernick. And that I think is his great contribution to to the struggle i mean and then what's it's what's going to be remembered much more than his say individual story i mean it's i, I it's going to be what that that method for doing what what he did um and yeah i forget why i was going down that path in particular no uh, no that was that was right where i was going because yeah you write about rodney axon jr who sure. i believe he was the first uh, player to take a knee after Kaepernick. Isn't, isn't that right? Yes. And, oh, just to say quickly, the place I was going is that people became like sports history mavens. You know, these young people, they, all they knew was Kaepernick, but then all of a sudden they're reading about people like Althea Gibson and Billie Jean King and Roseanne Robinson and Jackie Robinson and Ali and Smith and Carlos, like this whole world of history opened up to them that they just went through like sharks Love you know, all of a sudden they're reading for something that feels relevant to the, the, their their lives yeah and the arguments that they want to make when class is over no doubt and you know that you know the students at garfield who who led that protest had been reading your work and and seeing your film not just a game in my class so that stuff That's is awesome. important it gives them a whole other way to conceptualize their identity uh, and understand what they're doing as an athlete when they can see it as not disconnected from the rest of society. Um, yeah. And so, you mentioned you mentioned Rodney Axon. Um, I was so taken with Rodney. It's hard to choose. It's hard. I've been sort of ducking and weaving around, uh, telling my favorite stories from the book because th th they all mean a great deal to me. And I, I hate the thought in my head of even prioritizing them because. At the end of the day, this was young people just giving me a lot of trust when they didn't have to. I'm still convinced most of them talked to me just because it was the start of the pandemic and they were home and bored and had nothing else to do. Remember those first weeks of shutdown where there's just like, right. you're just done. <laughs> I think they were like, oh, cool. Yeah, I'll talk to this guy. Um, but but I, they, they trusted me. So I, I hate prioritizing them. But that being said, Rodney's story in Brunswick it has so much pathos to me because you know, he was growing up in Cleveland uh, and his family moved to Brunswick precisely because they felt like their neighborhood in Cleveland was uh, too much crime. And they, they saw this you know, path to the American dream through the Brunswick suburbs where they could go better school for the kids, less crime. But, you know, far from a better life, Rodney found himself, you know, outcast at school, uh, harassed by police. I mean, just not, you know, and, and not comfortable. Yeah not comfortable in his own skin and what can possibly be worse than that especially for a young person to yeah, feel yeah. that way and top it off he football was his outlet and he was good at it but he also wasn't starting and you know that that just felt you know kind of sleazy and gross like 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 because you, you just wouldn't know like is this because I'm like one of the only black kids on the entire team because it certainly feels that way but then his teammates start throwing around the N-word like it's nothing and to talk about opposing players. And when he said to them, you need to not do that, their response was to say to him, well, you're, we're not talking about you because you're our teammate. Basically saying you're one of the good ones. And mm -hmm. it, it broke his heart. And when you couple that with the Black Lives Matter movement that was happening, he was like, I need to do something. I need to do something. But, you know, he's not living in Ferguson. He's not living in New York City. He's not living in Seattle. 
He can't like just walk out in Brunswick and have a, a Black Lives Matter demonstration. But then when he saw Colin Kaepernick do what he did, it was like, bam, that's something I can do. That's something I can definitely do. And yeah. and he did it. Right. Yeah. And I love how you you write about how when he took a knee, he he said he wasn't actually thinking about Kaepernick. You wrote, uh, well, he said, quote, I was actually thinking of my teacher, Mrs. Burgess. Yes, she was. She was talking to us about the national anthem and about how the man who wrote the anthem actually owned slaves. And I, I just love that uh, the role of teachers and mentors showing up in your book is nurturing these youth. And and also like, isn't that just like a great example of the sort of thing that would make uh, you know right wingers, particularly in the state of Virginia, uh, particularly in Loudoun County like just keel over like, oh, you know, while, while, when I hear that, I'm like, that's what an educator is all about. You know, that's what it's supposed to be. You're trying to open eyes. You're trying to teach the truth. Absolutely. And, but if, if you're on the other side of the aisle, you look at that story and say, you know, you, you look at truth as something almost like toxic, like opening up a lamp and having a genie come out or something like, like, it's like, Oh no, look at you. you. You told them the truth about the anthem. And now Rodney, who was one of the good ones is now taking a knee during the anthem. How dare you teach truth? Yeah, The truth is dangerous, man. The truth is dangerous. <laughs> it's poisonous. You know, that's how they view it. Like, and I think that's one of the, like the great divides in this country right now. And it makes me wonder about us <laughs> ever able to come together is that, I mean, if you've, I, I view truth as the ultimate disinfectant and they view truth as poison. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the struggle so many of the educators in this room are in right now, just to say basic facts about U.S. history. Um, I got one more question for you before we, we move to, to breakout rooms. I'm excited to hear what comes from the breakout rooms and what, uh, conversations come up and and how educators dig into this discussion and um, think about how they want to use sports more in their classrooms. But before we get there, uh, I think sending us off with a conversation about how educators should teach about the history of sports, right? Why are sports such an important lens uh, for analyzing society and, and why have they been such a consistent site of social protest throughout U.S. history? And I was hoping you might also specifically tell the story of Roseanne Robinson as the first athlete to refuse to stand for the anthem and, and just other athletes educators should know about to teach the intersection of sports and the black freedom struggle. Ooh, so just a small question. Yeah, right. Um, I, I, I mean, I'll, this is what I think. I think sports is such a terrific lens because it's the ultimate lens to tell the story about the United States of America. And the reason for that is when sports begin in this country as an organized business entity in the 19th century, and tell me if this doesn't sound like America for a second, it's built on this basis. It's built on the basis of the myth of inclusion and the reality of exclusion. That's right. The myth of inclusion and the reality of exclusion. The, the myth of inclusion was how sports marketed itself from the very beginning which is this idea of the level playing field and anybody who's good enough can do it. So if you can play, you're taking the field. You know, that was how they talked about it in their little promotional films, you know, like, hey, start playing this new sport called basketball. Get a peach basket and give it a try. And anybody who's good enough can do it. So that was the myth of inclusion. But the reality, of course, was exclusion. If you were a woman, there's just nowhere for you to play. There's, there's no, no space for any sort of collective play. Uh, if you were black or brown, it was like, well, if you wanna form your own leagues over there, go ahead. But all the resources and attention and everything is gonna be located on what we deem to be the American and national leagues, which are going to be all white. And so from, but from the very beginning, from the very beginning, there is an effort from the marginalized people to be included in sports. There is a fight to take the field. There is a fight to play. And that in and of itself is like the story of this country. Like that there's 
an image and there's a reality and to try to make the reality even come close to the image it takes an absolutely relentless struggle that's right to make that happen and yeah. so teaching about sports is about teaching about that struggle so then moving forward if you teach about the civil rights movement they're the stories of Jackie Robinson, the 1960s Muhammad Ali, the women's movement, Billie Jean King, uh, the story of LGBTQ liberation in this country runs through the world of sports in so many ways. And there's so many resources that I could certainly recommend for folks if they want to use stuff for the classroom. There's a great compilation book called The Unlevel Playing Field, which I really recommend. There's a great book about women in sports called Nike as a Goddess. Um, there's a a terrific book that just came out this week um, called Hail Mary, uh, The Hidden History of the National Women's Football League. Which oh, is about this. You tweet about that. I want yeah, to it's an incredible out. story and not a history I was aware of, but what a history to tell a story of the 1970s and people feeling empowered and, and, uh, and that, that reflecting itself in the world of sports. Um, so I, I strongly encourage people using sports. And you mentioned Roseanne Robinson, I mean, what a great way to show a picture, uh, to start a class by showing a picture of Colin Kaepernick and being like, he wasn't the first person to do this. Yeah. And because you know, then you got the student's attention. It's like, well, who was the first person? This is Roseanne Robinson, 1959, track and field athlete, refuses to stand in opposition to spend the spending that's going on around the Cold War and the nuclear buildup. And then that becomes another question like, well, what's that about? You know, the Cold War, the nuclear buildup. What are you talking about? What a lens that, for teaching the Cold War, right? Yeah, you do it through the eyes of Rose Robinson and the fact that she um, not only um, sat during the anthem, but she also ended up uh, in prison and she had to go to hospital um, for a hunger strike because she refused a tax resistor. Uh, precisely because of the money that was being spent um, on the Cold War. So I love that story. And then just one last thing is like, it's like you show the picture of Tommy Smith and John Carlos. A lot of people know that moment from the 68 Olympics. I mean, it's on your shirt, Jesse. A lot of people know the moment, but it's such a teaching tool because it was more than a moment, it was a movement. And to begin to talk to folks about what that movement was, the Olympic Project for Human Rights, what it stood for, the pressure it put on apartheid South Africa and the Olympics, like the fact that they organized internationally, you know, all of these things are just such great teaching tools. And then you can point at the picture and be like, what do you notice other than the fists going up? And then you can point out that Tommy and John aren't wearing shoes to protest poverty or that they're wearing buttons that say Olympic project for human rights or that they're wearing beads and scarves around their necks uh, to showcase the history of lynching in the United States. And so it's all of these interesting, incredible, what John Carlos calls artifacts, you know, in the image that, yeah. that, that allow for just incredible discussions. We would love to see if any um, other major questions come up. I have a, a couple more questions that we can start with. And then if, if any questions come up, I can take a look at the chat box, but maybe we could just start with thinking about, uh, well, I would just like to hear from you, Dave, more about um, how you came to focus on sports as a way to analyze society. Um, I think telling us about your story and how you became a political sports writer uh, would be interesting to the educators here. Well, sure. I'll, I'll keep it. Uh, I'll keep it brief. I mean, basically, I was really into politics um, and movements when I was in high school and college. I was studying them, and I had this whole parallel life where I was a sports obsessive, and I played sports in high school, and I was, you know, super into it. But it was sort of in its own realm. And that really changed for me when a basketball player for the Denver Nuggets named Mahmoud Abdul Rauf made the decision to not come out for the national anthem. Um, all of a sudden, sports was a political issue and there were politics and sports and it was on Sports Center. And I know there's a whole history of this. We were talking about it before, but to me, this history didn't exist. I didn't know this history. I had no idea. 
And I thought I knew everything about sports, but I realized all I really knew were batting averages and not necessarily the way people's struggles would enter the world of sports. And that was, you know, my, th that became a kind of mini obsession. You know, I didn't have Google. I couldn't just say sports activists and see what came up. I had to dig, I had to do research, not only microfilm, but microfiche. <laughs> and, you know, just tried to read and learn as much as possible about athletes who'd been political. And, and uh, that's really where it started for me. And you know, what helped me a lot was a professor at McAllister College who, you know, Mahmoud El Khati. Uh, professor Mahmoud El Khati is somebody who taught a class called the Black Athlete since World War II. I couldn't get into the class, but this was where my obsession was. My roommate was in the class. So I just like read his books and would sneak into the classroom. Like, I mean, I, I read more for that class than I did for my own classes. And uh, that that's really how it started for me. And then, you know, I, I, I was really into the idea of the idea of being a political sports writer or writing about the politics of sports. Because when I started, when I was doing my microfilm and microfiche digging, I saw there was a, an amazing history in the black press in the Chicago Defender, the Amsterdam News, um, just really interesting. Uh, the Baltimore Afro American with Sam Lacey, certainly um, a Pittsburgh Courier, definitely of amazing political sports writing that took racism on. Um, I also learned a lot about uh, Lester Rodney, who was the sports editor for the Communist Party's newspaper in the 1930s and fought for the integration of baseball. And, uh, and then I got to meet Lester Rodney, who was in his 90s, and talked to him about what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to be a political sports writer like you. And Lester looked at me and he said, ah, to be 80 again. <laughs> it was very funny. Right. And, and so, so that, that's really what it came out of. It came out of a, both an, an anger at having history uh, hidden from me, but also a uh, feeling of responsibility to carry on a tradition. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, I'm seeing some great stuff in the chat that I want to lift up. Uh, first of all, if any of you have had students uh, participate in these protests, we'd love to hear about that. So if you want to drop in the chat uh, what happened at your school around the Kaepernick effect, we would love to hear that. And there's been some good questions as well. So JT says, Dave, what do you see as the WNBA role in the 2020 election and the activism, uh, possibly ahead of the NBA? Oh, definitely. Um, for, first and foremost, yeah, the WNBA has been on the front lines every step of the way. I mean, and predating the Black Lives Matter movement around issues like reproductive rights, uh, certainly women's rights. They, they've they, they've been, I think, more than any other sports league, a political weather vane to everything we're doing right now and everything we're seeing. Um, even um, protesting during the anthem, Colin Kaepernick was the first person to take that knee in the recent period. But it was um, basketball players on teams like the Minnesota Lynx who were, you know, not who were bowing their heads, wearing political T-shirts and holding hands during the anthem, which was in itself a step in that direction of saying, hey, the anthem is actually a political space. It yeah. is a political space. It's not this neutral space, it's political. And it was the WNBA athletes who first stepped into that direction. Also, yeah, the Senate, I mean, I, I have serious problems with what the Democratic Party is doing with this, but the Senate would not be in Democratic Party hands without the WNBA, simple mm -hmm. as that. Um, the work that they did um, in Georgia to, to elect uh, Raphael Warnock um, was essential. And Reverend Warnock, Senator Warnock says that, and um, it, it's acknowledged. I mean, it's going to be taught in political science classes, what these WNBA athletes did. And what they did that was particularly um, brave and historic was that it wasn't just them saying, we think Raphael Warnock would be a better senator than this Kelly Loeffler person. It's that Kelly Loeffler owned 49% of the Atlanta Dream, a WNBA team. Yep. So, and that Kelly Loeffler was running for office 
by using the fact that WNBA players were being political, like they were her own specialized team of Willie Hortons that she could point at and say, they're part of the problem. They're part of the problem. And her players, one of her players um, said, well, how about we meet and talk about it? And she refused to meet with that player, refused to meet with her. And, um, and so they said, all right, well, you, you don't want to talk to us. You're going to demonize us for the purposes of, you know, running for office and, you know, kissing up to the, the, the Klan community of Georgia, which, which she did. That's not, I'm not speaking just uh, extemporaneously about that. Um, they, they changed Raphael Warnock's enti the entire um, perspective of his campaign. He was only polling at 9% when they decided to support him. And they turned him into this national candidate because it was too delicious a story, you know? Like they're taking on the person um, who, who's actually has control over their lives. And they're, say, they're basically saying, no, you know, we're actually going to force you out. So it's a story not just about, you know, mainstream politics. It's a story also about labor. Um, and it's a story about how different women can have different uh, objectives politically in a given moment or situation based on, you know, whether they're on the floor or in the big box. And it was, it, it's, it's just, it's a story that I think resonates with students, especially because one of the people on her team who wanted to meet with her was eventually part of a group that actually bought her out and kicked her out of the league. Now, when does that ever happen? Yeah, that amazing story. Uh, so many good questions popping up. Um, yeah, I'm I'm curious about this too. Um, Martha said, any Kaepernick effect examples from outside the U.S., especially since you're in Barcelona right now? Oh, tons. I mean, it's taken European soccer by storm, um, Australia, New Zealand. The interesting thing out here is that, off, first of all, they don't, play the anthem before sporting events. That, that That's a lovely uh, US contribution to world sporting culture. Um, they often don't, um, except in very, very particular circumstances. But you do have, um, like in the English Premier League and some of the other soccer leagues, players taking a knee before the game. And for a while, I, I thought that that was, you know, a kind of whatever thing because you know it's being done uh with the approval of management it's being done as a team activity it's obviously not being done during the raising of any kind of flag so all they're really doing is taking a knee as a group to basically say we don't like racism so i thought okay that's a little different than what we're seeing in the states but then i had a, a reporter um from one of the irish papers who was interviewing me and he gave me a real history lesson that i needed to hear about just the, the incredibly virulent history of racism in European soccer and about how there are very racist fan clubs and they're also very anti-racist fan clubs. And so to have players take a knee, it is like them saying to their fans in a very, um, in a very upfront way, we side with some of you, but not all of you. Yeah. And that, that's important. That matters. I like that. I like that. That's really cool. Wow, there's a lot of teachers here that had students protests, right? Um, Sherry and Carolyn um, had some some really cool stories here about their uh, all girls high school um, joining the struggle. Excellent. Um, there's a there's an interesting question about how do you move from the protest, how do you talk to students about moving from the protest to real uh, action? I can't, I'm losing it in the chat right now. <laughs> uh, uh, like move to having an impact. Um, shoot, I wish I could read it out word for word. There's so many great comments here, I'm losing it. But I think it's a, um, important thing to grapple with what next after the knee um how do you talk to students about that 
Yeah, uh, how to talk to them about what they do afterwards. Like, what's the next step? I mean, that was a question I was asked earlier today, actually. And I mean, I mean, Jesse, I think you're better equipped to answer this than I am. Um, I just think the starting point is asking them what they want to see, and then trying, and then helping to facilitate their own vision. And because you know, some of the people I talked to, what they wanted was an assembly where they could actually raise all the micro and macro aggressions that they deal with at school, you know, and so and then they fought for that assembly and they actually won it. You know, that could be something. Um, it could be a change in the way that the sports teams operate. You know, maybe that's what they want to see. It could be that they want the school Senate to issue a statement about, you know, getting police officers out of their school. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of issues that can come up from, from something like this. But I think it's about helping them ar articulate their own vision and then working with them about how to put it in a, put it into practice. Cause if somebody's taking a knee, it's like, there's a demand in there. You know, the old expression, power concedes nothing without a demand. There's a demand in that knee. And so helping them figure, articulate what that is, I think is uh, really important. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, at Garfield, when our, football team became the first in the nation to have the entire team take a knee. Uh, they didn't just take the knee, which I think is really important in and of itself. I think sometimes adults can, can gloss over that and say, oh, all you did was take a knee, but what are you really about? Um, what did you do next? And, and I think to pause for a moment and honor the bravery of that, that they had the courage to, uh, to call out this country when so many others uh, don't, I think is important. But then the football team also said that ethnic studies, right, was something that all students deserve to have access to and helped organize to struggle for black studies and ethnic studies. And we won. Black Studies and Ethnic Studies in the Seattle Public Schools. And you also can't tell that story without uh, acknowledging the role of the, the youth and the student activists. So uh, let's see, just a couple more questions because um, we have some great ones in here. Uh, how do you encourage activism and athletes who have been shown the repercussions of speaking their minds are greater because of who they are and sometimes don't provide enough benefit to outweigh the risk? Uh, that's a great question too. I, I, I couldn't tell if the question was assuming that they had looked at the book and were seeing that level of backlash um, or if it was something maybe they just intuited themselves that they would receive a lot of backlash. Um, so I, I guess, if, if it has to do with them reading the book first, I think the book is not starry eyed. I mean, it's very, it's very like real in terms of what you have to confront and deal with. And I think, you know, th for young people that they appreciate that. I mean, it's honest, you know, it's honest. Like this is what you're going to have to deal with. And these young people though, that in the book, they say it was still worth doing. So just keep all of that in mind before you go ahead, go in eyes wide open. And also there's pre-work you can do as well, which I think the book at least helps. Like, like what, what do we know from the book? It, we know that it's always easier if you can get some teammates to do it with you because you can share the weight of the backlash. We know that um, it makes a huge difference if your coach has your back, but really think about that critically. Like, do you know your coach? And what will your coach say? And if you think your coach would have your back, talk to them about it. Talk to them about it. Um, yeah. And so like there, there, there are little things that can actually make it easier. Um, and another big one, this is just another case more recently, is see if you can build support in the school and have people taking a knee in solidarity with you in the stands, which is another thing that makes a big difference because then that becomes part of the story and it becomes more difficult to uh, write off um, people as being uh, uh, like a lone malcontent or something. 
because that's what they're going to try to do is they're going to use mockery and isolation and but but if you counter that with with numbers and with people power it destroys their narrative yeah yeah no doubt i love all the stories of resistance that are dropping in the chat like anna said it wasn't just the athletes who took a knee it was also the musicians right the right the yep. choir right the marching bands joining marching bands <laughs> someone with that. a bassoon took a knee yeah i love the and even sometimes some of the people who are doing the singing <laughs> of the national i I, I, inter I interviewed someone who uh her name is Le leah tice uh she was singing the national anthem at a sacramento kings nba game yeah. and took a knee yeah that's that's wonderful and then you have the on the opposite side jim talks about in his high school the head football coach said they wouldn't play if they took a knee so yeah. there's instances of of the coaches and mentors also cutting down the students Mm hmm because the last thing you want is for a student to educate themselves and actually try to do something with that education right um so many great stories maybe just end on one one last question um uh i think just the last year and a half has has been such a watershed moment in in u.s history in many ways with the uprising dealing with COVID 19 how do you think that this this movement and the activism of 2020 will be uh written into the history books how will future generations look back at this at this time that we're in right now well it's interesting you know there's that expression um history is written by the winners so it's like, how will 2020 be remembered? It'll depend on whether this generation is able to win. That's like right. if they're able to win an anti-racist future, then both the, the kneeling part of this history will be remembered, uh, Black Lives Matter will be remembered, and the fact that 2020 saw the largest protests in history will be remembered. And it'll be part of a narrative about how this country finally faced its past, its present, and in order to change its future. Now, if the people of Loudoun County uh, win, then we know how it's going to be remembered. 2020 will be about, you know, what, what they said in the 60s. They'll say it's about lawlessness. You know, the people who took a knee, they're going to be forgotten. Colin Kaepernick, maybe there'll be a picture of him in a Texas history book, but it'll be one of those pictures without a caption. And the student will say, can you tell me who this football player is? We love football in Texas. Who is this guy? And the right. teacher will say, I'd love to tell you, but I'm not allowed. That's the other future. Yeah. Well, the people in this meeting tonight have a lot to say about which future we end up having, right? It encouraging your youth uh, to participate in this uprising, teaching the truth. All these things can help us achieve the, that much better picture that you painted first. So, Dave, thank you so much for staying up late with us. Um, looking forward to hearing about your trip at a later date. What an incredible uh, conversation. And I, I think this will be so important for so many of the educators with us. We want everybody to fill out an evaluation form. So please don't drop off until you have uh, filled that out. And I just want to also recommend some of your other books, especially the youth uh, version, the YA version of Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. Everybody uh, should pick that up and pair that with the Kaepernick effect in your, in your classroom. Um, and uh, wow, look at all the love in the chat. Why don't we uh, uh, unmute real quick? and everybody give a shout out to dave we appreciate you being with us